Thank you. Thank you to the South London Gallery and to Margot for the invitation, um, but above all to Lawrence as ever uh, for uh, agreeing to converse with us. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Lawrence the first time almost 15 years ago, I think. We made a book together, uh, and it was a, a great sort of moment in which we could look together at everything he had done, uh, which I won't go over. I'm sure most of you know it. And, uh, and learn what it was to, to, to work with Lawrence, which is a joy, actually. Uh, but um, I was trying to get to grips with why I love this work so much, uh, why it resonates with so many people, uh, which it does. And among his generation, it's, I think, continues to resonate very particularly. Um, and I was trying to work it out, and I have a lot of reasons uh, we might get to. But the sort of clue I decided to go with was the fact that at your opening, um, I noticed that whereas in other openings people seem to come up to the artist and say, congratulations, um, people tend to come up to Lawrence, I noticed, myself included, and say thank you. Uh, thank you for this beautiful thing. We all get to bask in and observe again. Uh, thank you for another gift to uh, South London Gallery and to London and to the world, I suppose. And so this idea that it was somehow a, a gift, um, really, I, I, I started wondering why we might uh, receive it, have the sense of that. Um, why it feels like something given to all. Um, and the reasons might be, among others, um, the kind of care we have in what he's produced, you know? The care of this line all around it, the care of a sculptor to make sure that the weight and the light and the materials are very clear, the way all the decisions made in, in the lettering, that sort of second red line at the top, you have a sense that there's a lot of decision-making and attention uh, without it being formulaic or sort of precious. And then this other gesture made me think it was a gesture of, uh, of, of giving. Um, and which is kind of the greatest, I think, thing or a very you know, valuable thing that, that art can do in a way of thinking about art as a, kind of, as a kind of gift. And not least because we know, you know, in, in, in a few months this is gone. You know, it's a gift, it's given, it's done, and, it, and then it goes away. You know, it's, it's, it's not something any of us can really hang on to, um, least of all the artist, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, you know, it remains in photographs and on our memory, uh, but it, there it is, it's given and, and, and remains. And of course, in the other um, uh, spaces, you see the same thing, the attention and the care. Uh, Luki, it's great, it's a work, it's a show to look at with another artist, with an artist who can really point out the, the, the care of the, 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 the lines, the color, uh, the, the fonts, um, and at the same time not formulaic, as I say. So, all right, could we maybe, would you start, could we start there? This idea I might have to gift? take it a little bit out of this context. And thank you very much, by the way. You know, when you've, you have a colleague and the colleague seems to appreciate what you do, it makes you feel good. <laughs> But I'd like to put it into a real context. South London Gallery, the Tate, it doesn't really matter where it is, commercial gallery, it's a platform. It's a place where people could get up and sing. And I'm convinced that all artists, when they're given the opportunity, I had a very good crew here, and I had a very, uh, I, had, I worked with people who understood what I, my aspiration was. Perhaps it was idiotic, but it was an aspiration. Every single venue is a platform. And we're not talking about any kind of generosity. We're talking about the fact that when you have a song to sing, or whatever it is, and somebody will give you a decent stage and a decent sound system, you get up and you do the best you can. That is not a conversation. We take it for granted that every single artist, there is no such thing as a phony artist. There are artists who get a little screwed up because whatever system they have to fit into in order to survive tells them things. Well, being an artist means that you have to figure out how to listen to what they're saying and not pay any fucking attention. 
And that's the way it works. So it's not about generosity. I'm not a special person. The only thing that makes what I do special is what I make, each individual thing. And sometimes they fall on their face, and sometimes they don't. I'm sorry, it's just that the, this, I don't know where this came about, maybe in the popular press, that artists are trying to put something over on anybody. They're not trying to put anything over, they're trying to just show. But you, 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 you find okay, the right thing to say. I've you, been lucky. Okay. How do you, how do you, I mean, how, how do you determine the, the text? Where, how is it composed? Paying attention for and, and uh, art, it, I, I make this specific object, it's sculpture. And it's 2014. I, I understand in the, somewhere in the middle of the 60s where people were saying, how can you do this? How can you do this? You can do it because obviously I'm not particularly special. So if I can do it, anybody can do it if they choose to. But you take materials, something interests you, and from those materials you put together a configuration. And you only make art because you're not happy with the configuration that the world is presenting to you, right? You put it together, there it is. Now, <clears throat> I'm finished. I, I literally could go off and be a play person. I, I'd love to do that. But you've got to put it in some way so you clean it up, you translate it, and I'm using language and gesture. Remember, the majority of the people we know think that everything is in a straight line. The majority of the world doesn't even write that way, <laughs> much less draw or think. So gesture then becomes language. And then the last four or five years, I've been trying to develop into an idea that what I present can be presented in various kinds of things. And then you clean it up, the same as you clean yourself up when you walk out the door, and you present it. And if you're lucky, there's five or ten people in whatever group there are that, oh, yeah, okay, that's what this person's trying to say. End of conversation. It's not... We, we give credit to people for doing what they're supposed to do. Artists are supposed to put whatever it is they have to present into the best configuration they can that anybody who's, who they think can use that meaning can understand it. They don't have to accept it, but they can at least understand it. Is that okay? Is that an answer? Yeah, yeah, but, but you, I think your ambitions for art are... Yeah, maybe I'm... You know something? I'm, I'm 72 years old. I've been showing since I'm 18. Maybe I got reasonably good at what I do. But that's not really a conversation for a group of people who slept all the way out to, to Peckham. <laughs> let's, you know, let's, all right. let's, let's move it on. All right, well, let's talk, about, let's talk about what your art isn't, for example. So, for example, it's not uh, dematerialization. Uh, I, it's do not, you remember, you're not old enough, but uh, you cannot believe what it was like in the late 60s where everybody was screaming, I am dematerializing, I am not making an object. And you went in a room and it was filled with pieces of paper all over the walls and they didn't <laughs> exist. Yeah, but that never was a question. That was a silly question. But the, there are a lot of, let's say, silly questions. There's a lot of terms that could be applied to your work that really don't work, okay? Like, like dematerialization, like site-specific, oh. like institutional critique. These things that come and go that your work really never fit in. And maybe that's why it continues to, it never gets too attached to any of those kind of historical terms that... Maybe there is a meaning for what I'm showing. Maybe there is an idea of placing objects on, on, on a bank of a river. Maybe, maybe there is an idea that there's a flow that's going to be cut into. A course, dare I yeah, say that, it. That, that, that maybe that's true. Why should it have to fit in when why do you bother to make art? if what people are doing satisfies you. I had this crisis when I was a young person. I had to choose between civil rights and, so, and labor and, and what I was doing to change the world or change the culture. But I stood there and, and there was a Mondrian and it, it was working quite well for me and I really had to question, what was I going to do? The, somebody did it already. But happily, the world turns and something happens. And you, each, each body of work, every time you make a show, 
uh, any artist, and, and is in response to the fact of where you're standing at that particular moment. Nice if somebody has a history because then you think maybe they got it sort of right. It's like getting in a car and I don't know how to drive. And you know the person is driven from uh, Birmingham to Glasgow. You figure, gee, they know how to drive. So it's nice to know a little bit about the history of artists, to know that they sort of got along the way and they can drive <laughs> without dr running anybody over or crashing. But. Well, so you're, uh, that kind of commitment, social commitment, that's, that's never gone away. And I, I, I will... Why I should know, it? Well, Does so, yours ever go away? No. You wake up in the morning and you try to deal with the culture you see in front of you. Does your social commitment, which changes as you begin to get more insights and see things, does it ever go away? I don't think anybody in this room's social commitment ever goes away. Yeah, but not everyone can, can materialize it and manifest it and express it. That just happened. It seemed to be necessary at the time. Well, indeed, I, I, I will throw at you a line you once said, which I love, and a lot of people will know, but not everyone will, which is, I don't want to, you said, I don't want to just, I don't want to fuck up someone's drive to work. No, I don't want, so going to I work wanna, I want to fuck up their whole lives. Yes, exactly. I want to so, present a logic that will let them see their place in the world in a different way in relationship to the real world. And art is about materials. Yeah. It's not about feelings, it's not about anything else. It's about reality. And, you know, that's nice. <laughs> so, so I'm a language person. So I was trying to, try, I was trying to find some kind of uh, rule or some kind of continuity, something about the way you express, use language. Um, and, and failed. I mean, certainly there's never punctuation, although there's sometimes parentheses. Oh, no, there is punctuation, there is, but when there it? is, it has a reason. But just to accept the fact that you need this silly thing called a comma. Or a period. Or, or a period, or, or but the period point. very often has a meaning. Hmm. And there's absolutely no reason with this nonsense of contractions. But I'm using language, so that would be, a, that would be like looking at Matisse and expecting them to be doing the same kind of, who, Matisse was a, was a fantastic painter, brushwork, but he wasn't Caravaggio. <laughs> <laughs> so why not look at all that punctuation as Caravaggio? Syntax is one of the worst things you can have. Art is supposed to look a certain way. Who, who wrote this down? But, okay, like, but you have, a, there's a boy, there's, 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 a, there's a recognizability to the way the words are, okay? And you can group them. There's something about place, there's something about states, there's something about materials. Um, I thought, I said, oh, I know, there's never a command. But even that's not true, because no. learn to read art and give. So is there, a, is there do, you, do you have a sense of, of when, the, when, the, when, it's, when it sounds right? Or is, that, is it really about how it I, I should hope so. And uh, do you, do you get it wrong? Are there, are there, are I don't there... get it right all the time, but I sometimes do get it right. And, <laughs> and luckily, people like you notice <laughs> that one was OK. But I, I, I was wondering, for example, all the materials I was noticing. There's sweat, water, salt, mm -hmm. stone, wood. Mm -hmm. Are there ever, for example, precious materials? Are you, are you keen to use ordinary things? That's not ordinary. Uh, what is not ordinary? Uh, and uh, emeralds and, and diamonds are not precious, okay. as a matter of fact. I try to use, I, I had a vision when I was younger, and I still have it, that when you make art, you're not propagating one particular culture or another, you're propagating a human being living at that particular moment in time. And if you use materials that are possible for all people, then it not having a specific form becomes a real possibility for other people. So when you use materials that are out of reach or not known or something else, you're not, why? If you can't do it with a piece of stone, it may be a special kind of stone. Maybe it has to be a stone that comes from Iceland. That's all possible. So that's the choice of materials. But when you say stone, anyone can, can bring the stone they're familiar with, the, the wood anybody they know. Can, has an excess, and everybody basically knows what a stone is. 
Uh, perhaps somebody in the desert doesn't quite know a lot about wood, but they sort of know what wood is. There's some kind of wood. And anybody at the seaside doesn't really know about uh, sand without moisture. <laughs> uh, big deal. <laughs> when it's necessary, you use it. That's a good observation, though, sand without moisture. <laughs> oh, it's, there is a sand that has very little moisture. Are, are you aware, are, so are you manip, you're manipulating materials and that I you're a I try to. What does an artist do when, when uh, he or she makes a canvas, when they make a sculpture? You're manipulating material, of course you are. Because cause I was always trying to think of what your, how your art works, maybe as an image, maybe as a fragment. And it really, actually, when I finally said it's, it's sculpture, I really understood it because it does deal with materials, it deals with weight, it deals with place, it deals with position, chateau. Would, is that? Thank are you. you. You could have listened to me in the very first. Yeah, I know. You didn't have to go but through all of that. I, yeah, I know. I, I should have it, listened it, to it you. It said on the label, like cigarettes <laughs> will kill you. This is sculpture. But the other thing I'll say for you, Lawrence, is having read all everything you wrote in these last few days, um, You've been remarkably consistent. So what, what you set out to do, even though it, the form is different, the place is different, what you, what, what you were out to do, mm. it, it, it stayed really, you're really clear on that. Thank you, but uh, isn't that my job? Uh, I mean, that's a long time, like that you worked it out relatively at the outset. But it does get yeah. a little, and then you've got to figure out what the hell you're going to do next. A why. Why is the question, not what. What is a matter of skill? And we all develop skills, but why is the question? And can I go just jump a sure, little bit jump, jump. out of this thing of please, me? Please, please, jump. Thanks. Hmm. Because uh, I went to recently a, a conference, a, it was about calligraphy or something, where I don't believe that there's perpetual meaning. I think that things that people accomplish on Tuesday, very often on Friday, take on a new meaning as the world changes and as our knowledge of the world develops. But I had this one statement to make which led to quite a reaction. If you have an adoring, loving, supportive mother and you can go and tell them your dreams, your aspirations, and essentially what reward you want, and she can understand you, it's probably not worth doing. <laughs> and that would be my definition of what art is. Art is an attempt to deal with the situation in front of you honestly and not base it on what we have as a value structure when you started to do it. Sounds very idealistic and very romantic, but in fact, it's extremely pragmatic. Do you want to dance to the music of somebody else's time? No. But is that is that why so many contemporary thinkers, artists, curators still look at you? I don't know what they're thinking. I, I read them. You know, half the stuff I understand, half I don't understand. The same as you, the same as everybody else. That's not the point. The point is. We are trying to figure out a way to make art into literally a dialogue between the people who've chosen to be artists and the people who look to art for another sense of where their place in the sun is. And it has very little to do with the fact that you know a certain kind of thing and you know a certain kind of thing. Those things are wonderful. And you know, I think it's like 45 years ago I found myself at some place in the middle of nowhere trying to explain how history fit into our lives. And it was this Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet, which was a film from Hollywood about a doctor in Germany who decided that he was going to try to deal with all of the people in the demi monde, which is the world that I aspired to as a child and I probably still aspire to that had gotten syphilis or gonorrhea due to what was going on. And he did something with sulfur. It didn't, it didn't cure it, but it helped. 
and this was Dr. Paul Ehrlich. Now, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, in my eyes, is a hero, is somebody that you look up to, that you, he tried to do something, he sort of succeeded, but in, at the time, 45 years ago, I remember saying, if I was unlucky enough to get gonorrhea, I really would like penicillin rather than, than sticking with Dr. Paul Ehrlich's thing called Salverson. It's the answer I can give, it's the best. <laughs> okay. okay. But, I mean, I don't know how to explain this. Uh, I, I don't know the audience here, and I, I, I don't know, I know some of the people in the audience, but the whole point is, is that art is something that is a living, breathing thing. And it might, you know, we all sort of carry with us what we are. But every time you make something and every time you present it, it's supposed to carry with it what you learned from another artist, what you learned from somebody else, and what you've done. That means you can't have a basic block of what it's supposed to be. But you've expressed things you hope the work can do, that it can change patterns of logic, that it can give a yes. person a sense of their capabilities and their the ability to save their own lives. As you yeah. it. How do you, are there, I mean, is there something, how do you measure this, your own success in that? Is that a, a capable, have you, have you anecdotally, oh. or is there a moment you thought, yeah, that, that was what I was. This almost pursuing? sounds like it's going to be psychodrama. <laughs> Let's just say that uh, my dreams and aspirations when I make art for other people to be able to use it, very often maybe I don't get to use, but at least I can see what it was that I wanted. Okay, that you you okay. laid it open. Uh, okay, we're only human beings and we're only people, and sometimes uh, you stand there and you have a dream and you have an aspiration and you think. The world should be this way. The logic we look at things with should be this way. Mm. I make things that give people some way, I hope, that they can change their logic. And they don't have to end up doing what I do. And they don't have to end up any way that's possible. You know, it's this thing again about, <coughs> you know, I just did a book for Mumok, you know, the traveling, uh, the, uh, the big bus and things, about where in the world could this be beautiful? Because they asked me, I'd done something about value, how much is enough and all of that, and then they asked for one about beauty. Hmm. The problem is, it's the most horrible word in the world. It's a disgusting word. It's probably a word that's destroyed more people's lives and dreams than anything else. Is your mother good? Yes, my mother was good. Most people are lucky. Their parents are quite nice. Is your mother good? Yes. Is your mother beautiful? Yes. Now, what happens to the other enormous amount of people whose mother doesn't look like your mother? Well, that's what we've had in art. We've had this breakdown because of the necessity of a commercial system, of a way to make a living. And the most expensive thing in the world is time. In order to to have the time to make art, you have to have something, shoes, art, something you sell that you can trade for the time. Mm. And then we get into this idea of what is beautiful, what is fine art, we, what is better. We're into the same things that made you go into the art world to break down the hierarchies that you were faced with. And we immediately impose it back onto our appreciation of art. But you've also spoken well of the art world, and not in terms of being able to actually absorb ideas and open up possibilities. But that's what it's for. But it's, 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 it is for that. But it's gotten better in the time that you've been in it around? Obviously not. I survived. <laughs> no, I mean that seriously. I survived. I even had the privilege of raising a child. I'm having the privilege of having a grandchild making what I make. Therefore, it's, it, it can't be that bad. Better than the world at large? I mean, in terms of... Uh, um, the art world is... It used to be better than the world at large until it be, the academy took over. Oh, I thought you said the market, but the academy. No, the academy, the market. There's nothing wrong with the market. Oh, so the way they talk about you can, it? You can, you can ignore the market. The market is just what it is. So because of the way the academy's 
talked about it or no set up what they've world? done I mean Britain has just forced the entire world, the United States, Canada, all of Europe, into the Lisbon Accord. The Lisbon Accord says that there's going to be a cutoff date when public institutions are not supposed to buy art that's not made by an accredited artist. Yes, and it's also that they could have a thing called a, math, a, a, a doctorate of fine art. Yeah, with those existing. I, I don't get it. <laughs> I, don't uh, I mean, I made a joke one day, and I felt like a, a, a horse's ass because I said it, but if you have a master's degree in anything, you have to write a research paper in another language than your own. <laughs> yeah. Almost all the artists I know are monolingual, unless they were born somewhere else besides where they're living. <laughs> How did they get a master's degree? This doctor is going to be the same thing. They want to accredit one of the last professions that you don't need a license in order to do. The fashion world is the only world that came out against the Lisbon Accord. Huh. And it's for the academy. Academy is, you know, a, a teaching is a wonderful profession. But you've never done it. But what? You've avoided that, right? I, I very often at economic uh, consequence I've avoided it, but that's my own choice. A teacher is a very dedicated, really involved human being. Uh, the only trouble is, in order to do their job correctly, they have to assume authority. Mm. As an artist, I chose a long time ago to try to not have to assume authority. I really prefer, and I grew up in a really heavy political background, and a very heavy physical background. I tried to avoid imposition and tried to use presentation. So do you mean you want to make somebody or? do something, make it look attractive. <laughs> it's yeah. a hell of a lot better than threatening to beat the shit out of them. So are a lot of the decisions regarding typeface, language, about well, Those are all major authority? decisions on my part. But I had to design this typeface. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, isn't that part of my job? <laughs> but isn't the, it the part of every artist's job? They, they design what they're doing. Nobody comes along and says it has to be a certain way. Nobody comes along. When you get accreditation, when you get this other thing, you immediately bring it into a, a, into a patterning where you're first trying to show it's, you know, uh, I don't know, but uh, I don't know what people's lives are like, but there's always this thing that they always tell at least lower class kids. Do it this way, do it this way, and then when you get into the right position, you can do it your own way. Mm. Well, you do it this way, you do it that way, you do it their way. Your eyes were glittering. I used to see art students, because I do seminars, because I, I like, I, there's nothing, there's no more greater compliment to an artist than that somebody else chooses the same profession, <laughs> right? I have nothing against them. You see the eyes glittering, they're going to change the world. You come back four years later or three years later and, oh, that's not what education's about. They didn't learn any physics, they didn't learn any mathematics, they didn't learn how to read and write music, they didn't learn anything. They've been trying to fit into a system that by the time they enter it, and you see it now in the new with the dot-com stuff, is already old hat, <laughs> but they fit in. What a waste of human beings, especially the human beings that I'm interested in, which are the ones that are trying to make something that I never saw before. When I go to an exhibition, I don't know about you, but when I walk in, I want to not understand what the hell I'm looking mm. at. I'm a quick read. It might even take five minutes. I just want to try to figure out what the hell it is that I'm looking at. No, I want to be stopped. I want somebody to take my attention. Yeah, exactly. I want to, and then, uh, then you either accept it, reject it, you have your opinions or anything else. I don't want something that I walk in and say, oh, yes, that's good uh, class, that's good green, that's good yellow art, that's good white art, that's good black art, that's good red you art. You don't want to recognize it. I don't want to recognize it. I want, to, I want somebody to show me something that I haven't seen before. Do I dare ask if there's something of late you've seen that had that effect? I can't do that. No. Uh, I have a problem. I, I was just doing an interview recently that was sort of a big deal. And uh, what artists influenced you when you were young? You're always going to forget somebody. 
<laughs> so it's better to just say, you know, the things that somebody else did, I looked at it, made me want to be an artist. You know, you, you mentioned Mondrian, and then you, you've forgotten Manet, then you mentioned this one, you've forgotten that one. You mentioned Pollock, you've forgotten Chamberlain. You've, yeah. By the time you're all finished, it, it's not a point. It, we're, we're not running. This isn't about pop stars. <laughs> I mean, I make t-shirts with things on them, but it ain't about t-shirts either. Um, one thing I noticed about, in terms of, um, if I dare say, younger artists, I'll be careful, I'll be, I won't be too I, bad. Look, I, I had my first mean. show when I was 18 years <laughs> old. I, I've, told, I've said this to you before, you should know better. I know. And, I and, you know, and I started to show things at odd times. And so-called, the, the world used to be a little different. Uh, artists who were more prominent and had nothing to do with anything else, I was just a kid were not frightened by what I was doing. Mm. Some of them were perplexed, and I do remember one comment, which is the classic, and, you're gonna, and it really was said by two or three very, very substantial people at the time. Hey, kid, everybody says you're crazy. You're not crazy, but I don't know really quite what the fuck you're doing, but how the fuck are you going to make a living? <laughs> now, that's the kind of response one is supposed to have. Being young, being old, uh, all of a sudden having one life and then changing it and making art should have nothing to do with what we are looking at. It has nothing to do with the problems your parents had to survive, and it has very little to do. I'm sorry if I'm sounding so boom, 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 but I, I think this is a very, very decisive time in everybody's life. There's going to be another kind of a war, a culture war, that's making no sense whatsoever. All it's doing is killing an awful lot of people. But it's time for us to stand still and realize what is it are we trying to deal with? Okay. I remember getting up on a stage at uh, Art Basel, I don't know what, oh yeah, they were showing a film of mine, so I had to say yes. And uh, I got up and uh, with Jorge Pardo, who's an artist whose work, nothing to do with mine, but yet it is in the same direction, mm. genuinely. He comes from a loving, nice parents, working class background, went to work when he was quite young. I come from the same kind of thing. My parents were quite nice to me. I, you know, they were not the problem. It was all the people out on the street that were the problem. And uh, both of us looked at this audience who was looking for significance and said, we didn't learn a goddamn thing from it. It didn't change anything. <laughs> You ended up doing what you're doing because you figured out what it was you wanted to do. It had very little to do with the fact that you were poor, or you weren't poor, or you were privileged, or you weren't privileged. It has nothing to do with it. Art is one of the few things that when it hits the table, and I think we're in agreement on this, mm. it's what it is. All the anecdotes, all the stories, all goes out of the way. But when you're talking about the, not the what, but the why, it, it, I mean, at a certain position in the art world, you're given endless whys. People are constantly saying, do this, and would you do this, and giving you... Yeah, reasons. and you sometimes are totally attracted, and you try, and if it's not for you, you don't do it. And if it is for you, you do it. But you can't say they forced you. Nobody forces anybody to be an artist. It's the one reason that we're all sitting here and talking. It's the one thing. Uh, when I came to my mother, who I didn't have the best relationships with, but, and I said, I'm going to be an artist. I must have been about 16, because I was leaving high school, going into college. It was different times and different place. And it was all public. Uh, not public. That's different here. State. <laughs> And I said, I think I'm going to be an artist. And my mother looked at me and said something. And we really didn't have a lot of communication. And she said, Lawrence, you're going to break your heart. Hmm. OK, why? Art is for rich people and women. I think that there must be people in this room whose parents have said exactly the same thing. <laughs> so does that make you say, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm in? <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just said, OK, and went out. And I don't know. I tried to live the life of a beatnik. <laughs> <laughs>
Because the lifestyle of art is, is really rather attractive. Well, at least it used to be before it became corporate and academic. But it used to be really attractive. It was a hell of a lot better than the life that I'd come from. But were the, uh, were the abexers, I mean, you, you said a funny thing. I'm going to have to repeat it. That abstract expressionism was a, a invented to prove that men have feelings. <laughs> American abstract expressionism came about at the end of the Second World War, which was a total, total disaster. And because of the bastards on one side chasing the people on the other side, New York had a surfeit of European artists, and a lot of them were men. Hmm. They were not, they didn't have to hide the fact that they had feelings, that they had emotions, that they had aspirations, that they had dreams, that they had fantasies. And abstract expressionists in New York and all over began to deal with these artists. And it became that, yes, which led to a strange kind of a problem. I grew up in the midst of that, where they got super macho with, you know, engineer boots and fucking everybody they could and drinking and heavy stuff to show that they were still male. It was a time in life in the 50s that if you lost that masculinity, you were dead on the street. Mm. And in fact, in places like where I grew up in the South Bronx, dead on the street meant dead. It didn't mean you were shunned or you were anything else, you were dead. They went a little bit overboard on their personal lives, and a lot of them have reprehensible personal lives. But the work was all about the fact that they were human beings with feelings, with understandings, and with aspirations. Well, that was it. It's not a big deal. Well, except we think your generation was it interesting? But there's, there was something in what the abstract was interesting. There was a good. lot. I learned a lot from it. I, 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 the first paintings I ever tried to make were essentially abstract expression. Hmm. The first things I tried to do. You don't think blowing holes in the ground is abstract expressionist? Yeah. I don't know what else it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wrong. It took me six years to figure out that I had done this work that everybody seems to happily find interesting. It is interesting. But. I thought each individual explosion was a specific work of sculpture. And it took me really a lot of getting confused, going around, only making paintings for children, giving up on the art world, doing the whole nonsense, to realize that no, it was the idea of the explosion that was what interested. But it, I, it didn't come out of the heavens. Just in case, so you, 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 you did the explosions and you, num you, you numbered the, whole, the little craters that were produced. Nobody was interested enough for me to number. What was the difference? I thought each one was a wonderful sculpture. I was at that stage in my life where people would, like, were traveling around the world like Johnny Appleseed, leaving <laughs> sculptures here, doing things there. There was no market, per se. It was, you tried to survive, and somehow or other we all did. And but and, and but it was important that you met a lot of you you, you became part of a of a, of a conversation and exactly a, a conversation with people who sometimes the first time you met them the first time you met somebody like Janae who was looking for boys and you, know, you were pretty and you were standing there you stood there and you went <laughs> I have no idea I mean the generosity of 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 people towards what you call younger people is one of the great astounding continuing wonders of the Western world. <laughs> that somebody's standing there going, they wait until they could get out the 14 sentences to say you're an idiot or that's interesting. But that's what you do, that's how you do it. Artists, when they go to art school, it's not about learning how to do something. Anybody can learn how to do something. It's to develop a language to talk to people who have something in common with you. But did that, <coughs> did that have, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, was there, was there a moment where things changed that a text, a public text of your, a work of text-based work, as it's called, was a mess, was, a, was, a, was some kind of text, and then it turned into a Lawrence Wiener? I mean, was there a shift when all of a sudden it, there was a recognizable? I would be the last to know. 
Because you've talked about your work, uh, one way you, I believe you're kind of okay talking about it is as graffiti, for example. No, no, the, the application when it's put into a public space is a form of graffiti. And I can justify putting art out on the firehouse. I can, I can justify putting art out in the world by saying that graffiti does have an ex extent right to exist, as long as it says something. If it says the sky is blue, or my children are hungry, we have a real conversation about who has the right to do it and not. When it says, Mi Jose, 42nd Street, which is an existential plea, everybody in the world, every single morning that they get up and they have to go to work, has an existential plea. It doesn't count. It doesn't constitute a meaning or a reason for art. Oh, so there's, a, there's that's a specific. Anguish is not a reason for art. You do not profit de misère. You don't profit from misery. What you do is you try to find something that is a signpost. That's something for people to use mm. to understand maybe their relation to the world. Mm. That has nothing to do with their ethnics, nothing to do with their background, and very often nothing to do with their personal circumstances, but their circumstances as a person within the world at the time. That's all art is. That's what this little show is about. Look, in fact, well, speaking of things your art isn't, maybe, yes. it's not unframed. I mean, here I think you've actually sort of drawn a frame. But, but the frame is also- room. But the frame is also the culture. I mean, is there an unframed- The frame art? is this room. The yeah. frame is also the fact that in a public institution, enough people thought it was interesting enough for me to be brought in to try to present something to other people. Hmm. Okay, isn't that every single exhibition that happens in the world, anywhere? <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's in, you know, if it's in Afghanistan or if it's in Nigeria or if it's here. Somebody invites you in, you get up on this platform and you do the best you can. And have, have the, Let's, let's call them invitations, just or opportunities, or desire to make work. Has that okay. been continuous since you I don't know. You, you know, you want to hitchhike a ride, you go and you pull your skirt up and you put your leg out. <laughs> but has Something it been, has to attract somebody. But has it been continuous? I mean, is there, is there either highs and lows and gaps and, and when you don't have things to say or you, there's no one who wants to listen? Has it been pretty continuous? Oh, it will happen, but it hasn't happened. I, I've been, as I said, uh, Maybe I had, I lowered my expectations when I entered into the world doing what I do. But I, I've been basically able to do it more or less publicly for quite some time. That's but again, it was lowering expectations. It was doing without or doing with. But that doesn't have anything to do with the work or it doesn't have anything to do with why you find the work interesting. That's all each person's problem. Still fairly rare, that kind of. I don't think so. There's a hell of a lot of artists out there that make really good work. Yeah, and have. Well, then it's not rare. The people <sighs> stay, still pay attention at a pretty sustained level? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're, giving me an, you're giving me a reason to sit here and think, why don't I just say, Let's float for a while and let's go to the, you know, Alice, let's go to the Caribbean and let's, you know, I like to drink. I, I, I get along real well in these places. Why shouldn't we just go there and stay there for a while? It, it hasn't happened. Maybe it will after this. <laughs> Maybe I'll have the post, yeah, the post GW. The post <laughs> LW. Yeah, the, post, the LW will take on post GW. You like that? Well, I don't want to be. Come and visit. <laughs> we've actually, we've. Alice you know, is, is, is quite nice. I, I may not be. That's beside the point. <laughs> you know, we've talked for almost an hour already. What? We've talked for almost an hour. Should we ask? If oh, if there's anybody in the audience that, you know, I think I've been shooting off my mouth a little bit too much. I'm sorry. But if there's anybody in the audience that has anything they'd like to either use the opportunity to make a speech or to ask a question, that would be just fine. <laughs> Someone has. Yes. Yeah, um, oh, here we are. Uh, could you say a little bit about um, impermanence? Because many of, uh, I'd say the majority of your work is only there for a, a, a 
period of time, it's temporary, rather than when we think of sculpture, we, sculpture, we normally think of something that is permanent. Hmm. What is, it? Well, is, is the fact that it's only temporary um, affecting your work? Oh, it affects it, but you, you, you're affected. But uh, there is a real question here. Presenting something that somebody rejects doesn't mean you're imposing it. If you present it in such a manner that they can walk away from it and it doesn't really uh, upset their existence, but if they do pay attention, I do expect that the logic of it will change their existence. And then you've imposed something on them, but you haven't imposed it in any way with any authority. They've chosen to follow it. They've chosen to look at the logic and realize that there's a possibility of doing something a different way. Is that, that's as close an answer as I can give to that because if you're asking what my feelings are, uh, yours too, you write something, I do something and somebody rejects what you really spent a lot of your life on. Uh, yeah, you don't feel good about it. And you don't really have disdain, you just wonder first, did I not really, because everybody should accept what you're saying because you're convinced it's correct. Did I, did I screw up or, or what? But yeah, of course you, you feel there's something wrong, but essentially your job is to present it and hope that you can entice somebody into starting to think that way. And in thinking that way, they present and make something that doesn't look like what you do, but it has the same sense. And from that sense, you can enrich yourself and you can keep going. So the involvement, what you're talking about, this continual thing, mm. as something enters a culture, and it slightly changes the culture, it makes it a little more amenable for you to wake up in the morning and try to keep going. But also in response to the <coughs> gentleman's question, is that impermanence part? You just do it and let it go, and then, it's, then it What else can going? you do? What, what do you want to do? Uh, there was, there was an, a, a scene in a movie of a you know, K-29, the, uh, the uh, submarine movie, of these men that had fought for the Soviet Revolution and they had brought about a complete change and they're walking through the Hermitage and all you hear is clank, 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 clank. And it's all the medals bouncing up and down. But meanwhile, they were still dressed as if it was 1946, all gussied up and everybody was all, men and women just, they were living in another world. You can't live like that. It's, you'll end up being one of those things that was in London in the 60s. Somebody who had, you know, was a porter somewhere because they had really been brave in the war. But that's not what our job is as artists. You can't, you can't do that. You, that's why the academy is a little bit of a problem when you teach in it and all. You are given too much you should be well treated if you accomplish something in life and then you decide that's as far as you can go. But it doesn't give you any right to impose anything on anybody for the rest of the time. So there's your answer and that's the problem. You, you did it, they let you get up on the stage and now, hey sweetheart, it's time for you to sing again and you better have something else to sing about. You can't sing Melancholy Baby all your life. Is that an answer? Yeah. <laughs> you got the yeah. Hi, um, you talked about um, Goddard influencing your film work. Could you talk into the microphone? Oh, yeah. hi, sorry. Thank you. Um, you talked about Goddard influencing your film work, and I wondered if there were any writers or poets who influenced your text. I know it's material, but I was interested to hear. Uh, I've even used works of mine in songs that I've worked with musicians, where it's presented within the body of the song. Uh, it becomes recognizable that it's sculptural. Uh, if somebody uses it in their, in their thing, uh, I guess it's the way it's supposed to be. I think we make art that it should enter the culture. You begin to get angry if somebody's exploiting it or something and you get nothing. But that's a different question. The question, the point is, is that you make something and you put it out in the world and you'd like to see people start to use it. I guess I have to leave it at that. Yeah, so it, it but as far as poetry, I make 
really a terrible poet. It's everybody's aspiration when they're very young to be a poet, and I'm not a good poet. I'm not a bad sculptor, but I'm certainly not a good poet. And uh, poetry is really, you know, there's a joke amongst uh, artists, especially in, in, uh, that, of myself, that use languages. Uh, poetry was invented because somebody saw a work of art that they wanted to tell somebody about. <laughs> You said other interesting things about that, if I may. Yes. That you once said your work is the opposite of poetry because if poetry is about putting into language the untranslatable, yes. what you want to do is translatable. It I spreads. want everything to be capable of being moved from London to Tokyo mm. to, to uh, any place else mm. without being exotic. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it doesn't fit, maybe it has no use, but it's not exotic. <laughs> but that, but you see, for me, the fact that it's so transportable, you know, that is any, that is part of that, that it goes and That's moves. one of the things that I will take credit for having yeah. tried, tried to bring about. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I find exotic when you, when you, when you exoticize an artist, you're taking away all of the value of the work. Mm. You're putting it into some sort of thing, and they're only, this work is, only good because of their base is a certain ethnic, their base is a certain this. No, 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 it's good because it's good and it functions. All the rest of it's nice to know. It's like art history, and you should know all of this. But when you look at it that way, you've demeaned the person who's putting it in front sure. of you. Yeah, you've reduced That's my you feeling, I really do. And yet, everywhere I turn, everything is now X art, Y art, G art, be art. No, that's not the point. They've chosen to use art. And it might not look like art you've seen before because it comes from another place, but it functions as art. And it doesn't have to be exoticized. Mm. It can work right next to everything else. Mm. And if it don't, it ain't worth much. Something I've always, I forgot to say, I just, for, for someone who works so much with text, you, you really don't like labels, which is interesting. There are some words that are, that are there, there are some words I'm, you, you, you keep saying what like. I like and what I don't like. Well, you have no a, idea what I like. I know, I but like. the names of the I X and the Y. I think that labels are a denigration of the aspirations of people around you. Okay, That's a, that is a different way. Of it's a choice. You know, I, I did that thing, I'm gonna go back to Glasgow in, in a month. Oh to dedicate a project, and I remember once being drunk and, and stupidly going into a, into a bar that had amateur night and, and doing a Lenny Bruce number, <laughs> an anti-racist Lenny Bruce number explaining, I don't know why I did it, and, and the people that I was working with were so angry, I, I lost it. And I did this number uh, about explaining that you don't understand you lose all of your rights when you are a racist because you can't turn around and say, I don't like Lebanese food without it meaning something other than you didn't like haggis fried or you didn't like a Mars bar. You lose your own privileges in life to have opinions and feelings by taking on this other stuff. Well, luckily, in the middle of it, some guy, some guy said, here, here, and they grabbed him, smashed him up against the wall, uh, hitting photographs, and said, let the fucker finish his turn. <laughs> well, I finished my turn, and I afterwards realized there were all these men in, in, in gray canvas kilts that had been playing rugby all day, and if it had gone the wrong way, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> or I wouldn't be sitting here in the same form I am. But it went all right, because it's a logical thing, and I think that that can be carried into the art world. When you start to label things, when you start to talk about things in generalizations, not in cultural terms, you lose all of your personal perceptions. You lose things that you're supposed to be able to have. You don't have to like a deep fried Mars bar. It doesn't mean you're anti-Scott. You don't have to like this. It doesn't mean you're anti this. You don't like it. That's it. You don't eat it. Okay. And art is probably the same way. If you don't want what they're selling you, what they're showing you, you can reject it and walk away. I'm 
problem is, is as you get older, and if you decide to have children, if it was any good, your children will notice it right away. And you'll not understand what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting. Do you point. think that the highest form of art yes. needs to be expressed at all then? Needs to be expressing what? You know. Expressed in the first place. Because I don't know. No, no, I wouldn't. I'd like to get out of that highest form of art. Uh, I think if you're talking about in terms of what the most successful thing for people to make is, is something that can stand all by itself and be discovered, almost as a cairn on the side of a roadside. So I wouldn't know whether expression or not expression or expressing certain things is a higher form or a lower form. I like the things that you just find along the way and you try to make sense out of them. Because the whole purpose of making art is about presenting meaning that hasn't yet found a context. And I, I feel like I'm repeating myself too much, but we think of art as something you put out there and it floats. And it has no place to be. Nobody asks for it. Nobody knows what to do with it. And in banging against everything to try to find a place, it's functioning as art. After a while, it sort of finds a place, it gets used, it comes down, and it's just on the table, uh, very much like uh, those are the accomplishments of human beings. There it is. But art is at that wonderful moment, that's the highest form of art, when it doesn't fit anywhere. It doesn't really, it functions, it got in the door, you got into the club, but then they're looking at the way you're dancing and it doesn't fit. But you got through the gate, because that's the job of an artist, is to get through the gate and get past the bouncer. That's all part of the profession. But so highest form and lowest, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, Hi. It's John here. A practical yeah. question. Yes. When you begin to compose the words that will be in a piece of work, such as the one we see here, yeah. do you begin with spoken words or written words or do you think about it in your head? What, is there a, any kind of routine or technique you have at that, the beginning of that process? You're asking trade secrets, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> no, I, well, this comes about with my fascination from the silliest thing is, is that you can't step in the same place in a river ever. It has very little to do with the words or language. It has to do with the phenomenon of what the banks of a river are about and erosion. The words just are the words that we learned, if we were lucky enough to have an education, that we learned to say that, to deal with that phenomenon. My work is essentially phenomenological. It's really all about the things themselves. Stretched to the limit is really about that. Oh yes, I have a certain kind of, a, of an education, a certain kind of a sense. I can turn it and use the words. I have a, 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 I have a larger vocabulary than most then. And I can use the words to find the right words to say it. And then you clean them up. And you try to put them together and there they are. But it's essentially phenomenological. It's really about a human being's relationship to objects. And the phenomenon of a, of a riverbank is, is an object. That's so, it. Lawrence, when you work in a language that's not your mother tongue? No, it doesn't come as I wish it did. It would make life a hell of a lot easier. It doesn't just come as a flash of some words that fall together. The only time that's happened to me recently was uh, at a calligraphy conference when I realized that, uh, depending upon what region you're from, but the sign, the, the uh, calligraphy essentially for I in Chinese and Mandarin is Wu O Wo, and I did Wo is me. But that's a word game. That's the same thing that anybody does. That's not art, though. Okay, but uh, you can't make art from that. But you can make something rather amusing, and you can make it look beautiful and draw it. But no, this particular work is all phenomenological. It's all about literally uh, if one 
was lucky sitting on the bank of a river and contemplating its almost Newton's apple. Thank you. Uh, I'll just, uh, as, a, as a writer rather yes. than an artist, what is, you know, I mean, writers go, spend years trying to get a voice and trying to make it sound like and polishing and, and, and you, I mean, you do make Thank it heaven. sound, but you make it sound so easy. The literature that we've been involved but in. you, you accomplish it. I mean, you sort of, you, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't get away with it because that's what I do, but it's a very, well, it's a you. totally different thing, right? You know, this is really, I must say, uh, if, if I was, you know, it certainly is very good. You're, you're telling me that what I've tried to do, I might have done reasonably well. Thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. Pleasure. No, I mean that seriously. But let's not question it. Let's, it's like when, when you walk into a room and there's, there's five paintings of somebody's on the wall and they got it right. How did you do that? Other yeah. people have tried, and the scientists have tried to do this and the, this. They got it right. And it'll be right until it's not useful anymore. Then it's not right anymore. It's just a history of somebody who got it right a couple of years ago. But, for example, like, yeah. the, like river and flows and waves yes. and the course, are those, like, are those things that you consciously put together or not really? Yes, the, I know the things that, that I consciously noticed existed. Okay. okay. And that you want to bring together. And then I bring together and I present to other people and wow. Yeah. And then maybe they put that together and they present something to me and then back. No, I, I hate to sound nice about it. It's not nice. I mean, my idea of making art is to make it impossible for certain things to exist. <laughs> By doing it right, once you've got it right and you're presented, other things have a lot of trouble existing. Good. That's the point. Art is made from anger. Anger with the situation as it is. But that doesn't mean you have to be rude. You, can, you know, it's that thing about if you're in a place like parts of Papua New Guinea or something, talking to somebody th philosophically, killing is nothing. You're just going to be in another place. But humiliating somebody is something nobody wants to do. And that's my point of making art. I want to make it impossible for those things that I don't approve of to exist. But it's not about winning or losing or humiliating. I like that. I like the idea that it's real. I like extreme places like the Arctic or jungles. There's no anecdote. You fuck up, you're dead. There's no story. Yeah, but you don't come back and give a story of how, how you managed through the airport or you managed through here. It's over. You don't make a mistake and you come back and then it's fine. You don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> Does that, I mean, does that account for the kind of dignity in your work? I hope so. Artists risk that every person who decides to make art takes the chance of losing, and I use it as a metaphor, the most important thing in their life, the love of their mother or the love of their culture. That's what you can lose when you start to make art because you make something that might just put you outside of that. But that's the profession, and that's one of the nice reasons that there's no conscription to be an artist. You wake up and you choose to do it or you don't. But that's what it's about. Art is a very serious business. You change the configuration of a culture that you happen to find yourself in. And if you're lucky, you change the configuration of other cultures as well. And we can leave it at that, don't you? I mean, it's like uh, there's no, uh, it's not liberty on the barricade. It's like culture is the one thing we have that we have some control over. And what that control looks like and what it deals with really depends upon the world that continues to turn. But we do have a control over it. And we're fucking responsible for it. You can't moan about how awful the art world is and not try to build something that can, that can manage to get out without having to do what you think is awful. Okay, but that's not my problem. It it's, was my problem, 
and tomorrow it might be my problem, but I'm sitting here with an audience, it's not my problem tonight. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I, Margo, you have a thing, can we? Yes. Yeah, I, but we couldn't get one question from Lisa. Was there a last one. question? Yeah, uh, or no. Yes. The Junior Cree. Uh, I think you get Hey, it hi. <laughs> a question about sculpture. So there's one definition of sculpture that it's subject to gravity and revealed in light. So if that's true in this room, what's above the line and what's below the line? Oh. Maybe the line is the river. Maybe. That's the way I read it when I was look, looking and doing the planning. Maybe the line is the river. But it's not a metaphor for the river. Maybe it is the river. Maybe there, at the point is, the nice thing with the river is, is that there's no up and down. If you're a fish, you're looking at it one way. And if you're a bird, you're looking at it another way. But I think maybe the line, if you want to give it something, make it something, it's the, it's the river. Because once it goes in the river, that's what happens. Lisa, that once it goes in the river, the gesture is what happens. Before it goes in the river, that's the thing that puts it into a context that it exists. So let's say it's the river. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's the river. Yes. The horizon. The hori no, it's not a horizon, it's, it's a river. Well, thank you all oh, terribly thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you to Jordan.